All right, good. Good morning, everyone. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I've changed the title of my presentation to Visual Facilitation of Auditory Encoding and the Role of Slow Network Activity because I realized speech comes in only at the very end. And I'm also very careful about not talking about oscillations because after more than 10 years looking at auditory cortex and different species using five, six different techniques to look at brain activity, I'm not really convinced that there is something like really narrow band oscillations in the auditory system, at least not as nicely as we see, for example, gamma in the visual system. <laughs> However, that doesn't rule out that certain frequency bands have a very privileged role, as I will try to show you. Now, most of our work is actually driven by a slightly different question, and we're interested in how the brain integrates multisensory information. And 20, 30 years ago, people would have argued that the different senses operate as largely distinct streams, and integration happens only in very high-level brain regions, in the association regions. That then, 10, 15 years ago, um, Peter Lakatos, many others, and ourselves, sort of promoted a different view where the different senses interact already at rather early stages. And one system where we have seen this very nicely is the auditory cortex. And so we started out doing high resolution fMRI in the macaque monkey, and what we found to our surprise is that some parts of auditory cortex um, were driven by just visual stimulation, and you see nonlinear interactions of acoustic and visual stimuli in driving the fMRI bold signal. And then we used uh, electrophysiology to really ask what is happening at the single neuron level in auditory cortex when a sound is accompanied by the matching or non-matching visual information. And what we found is that firing rates of individual neurons are indeed affected by the visual context. They're often they're reduced, but actually it doesn't matter in primary auditory cortex whether there's kind of a semantic match between the sound and the visual context. For example, if you uh, um, pair a monkey coo with the matching video of a monkey vocalizing or a lion or even the grating, you get about the same uh, multisensory influence than if you have the congruent stimuli. However, what is really important is the relative timing between the visual and the auditory input, and we see multisensory interactions in a particular time window when the visual stimulus leads the auditory stimulus by about 80 to 20 milliseconds, which is exactly the time window in which we perceive the two senses as being physically synchronous. Now, this is just showing that neurons are somehow affected by visual contextual information. Does it actually add an encoding benefit? Yes, it does. For example, what you can see or you can quantify how well you can reconstruct the sound envelope from single neuron responses. And this uh, is, you can do this much better in a multisensory context than if you just have the sound. Now, that's a very nice finding because in a broader context, it shows that if you go to a noisy bar like last night and you talk to someone and you can better understand the person talking to you by looking at his, at his lip movements, this multisensory interaction happens not only, or probably not only in high level language brain regions, but it also involves early auditory cortices where activity and the sound encoding is enhanced by visual context. So that's very nice. Um, and then we sort of tried to understand how mechanistically does this really happen. And one answer that had been put forward by Peter Lakatos, Charlie Schroeder, and many others is that this happens by resetting slow rhythmic activity which reflects changes in cortical excitability and thereby selectively amplifies certain auditory inputs. And that's where I got distracted by looking at rhythmic brain activity. Um, so this hypothesis, um, which we all know very well, is driven by a number of, of observations. One is auditory cortex seems to be entrained by auditory inputs, which you can take as sort of, in a broader context, that syllabic or prosodic structure maps onto auditory cortical activity. And we see this entrainment as sort of a, a more a tight sort of alignment across trials of the phase or the power of ongoing rhythmic or, if you want, oscillatory brain activity, which you see both in intracranial LFPs and the phase is entrained more than the power, or you see it in human scalp uh, EEG or MEG activity. Similarly, if you look within auditory cortex, we see that the activity of individual neurons is tightly locked to this uh, rhythmic activity in the LFP. So if you, this is uh, the activity of one neuron during many repeats of a long sequence of naturalistic sounds. And what I'm showing up here is the theta phase colored across trials. And we see at some instances during the sound that theta is reliably entrained, at others it's not. 
But when the neuron is active, it often fires at the same phase of the theta cycle. And so there is some interaction or a relation between the firing of the neuron and particular phase angles of this rhythmic network activity, which has interesting implications for information encoding and also shows or promotes the hypothesis that delta or theta reflects maybe cortical excitability. This has all been nicely summarized in, in this uh, Giro and purple diagram, which sort of predicts that stimulus-induced um, oscillations, in a way, um, induce temporally organized spike trains, which thereby sort of implement a chunking of the acoustic information, which then facilitates downstream decoding. I think that's a very nice hypothesis, um, and it makes a number of predictions which we have tested over the last years. One is that there should be a direct relation between the local network rhythms and really sensory gain control, not just firing rates, but sensory gain control and information chunking. There should also be a perceptual correlate of phase or power on, on perception, and all this should make sense in the network context, and we'll come back to this later. Now, the first hypothesis, um, which is very central, I think, to this idea that, that rhythmic activity reflects um, sensory uh, gain control hasn't really been tested very explicitly in auditory cortex before. If you look at network simulations, it is quite clear that this rhythmic activity arises from an interaction of excitatory inhibitory neurons, and even simple models like this uh, Mazzoni model here can reproduce realistically looking local field potentials when driven with natural stimuli, both for visual and auditory stimuli. And these simulations predict indeed that there is not only a change of firing rate with the phase of the slow network activity, but is also in a way reflects changes in excitability. However, whether this is true for real neurons in actual auditory cortex is unclear. And so we tried to test this. And this is data not from the monkey, but from rat auditory cortex collected together with the Sakata lab at Strathclyde University. And so what we did is we, we recorded uh, individual neurons in, in primary auditory cortex when they were driven with a series of naturalistic sounds matched to the rat's hearing range. And again, this is one example neuron. Here you see the delta theta LFP phase color-coded the spikes of that neuron during many repeats of the stimulus, and we see again there's a tight relation between the phase of the LFP and the spikes of the neuron. And indeed, if you look at the modulation of firing rates of single neurons as a function of the phase and different frequency bands, we see this color-coded here, both during stimulation with natural sounds and spontaneous activity, there's many more spikes at here, the, the trough, uh, than at the peak of the LFP, and this firing rate modulation is strongest, let's say, between 1 and, and roughly 8 hertz. So, indeed, there is a correlation between spike fire, neural firing and LFP phase. Does this really reflect some kind of changes in the information encoding? Does this reflect kind of a gain control? And how can we test this? What we did is we, we looked at individual neurons and modeled their sensory input-output functions using what is called spectrotemporal receptive fields, which is essentially a linear filter mapping the spectrotemporal sensitivity of the neuron onto a, a linear filter, which is then fed through a, a nonlinearity characterized by two parameters that are quite important here. One is a gain, an output gain of the linear filter, and the other is a stimulus unrelated uh, sort of background activity. And the whole thing is then fed into a Poisson spike train generator. And so you can write this down as an equation here. And people have known for many years that these linear, nonlinear models give a reasonable approximation or fit to single neurons and auditory cortex. And these are some of these linear filters which characterize the frequency selectivity of these neurons. That's sort of old-fashioned, but what, what you can do then is you can ask what happens if we make these models state-dependent. If you render, for example, the gain or the stimulus-unrelated uh, background offset or activity dependent, for example, on the phase of the LFP in, in a specific frequency band. And you can do this using model comparison. You can look at different models, but what is important here in blue is sort of a state-independent model, and in red is a model where both the gain and the background activity are dependent on the phase of the LFP. And we see that the predictive performance of these models increases dramatically from about 0.18 to 0.3 R square if we render the gain and the background activity dependent on roughly the one hertz phase of the LFP. So 
we can better explain the sensory transformations of these neurons if we don't consider that their input-output relation is static, but is actually changing by the state of the ongoing activity. Um, you can also see how well these models then predict the actual modulation of firing rates. Um, and in black here is the actual data during stimulation and spontaneous activity. And sort of the classic S static STRF models provide a very poor approximation to the modulation of response rate by LFP phase because that's not really incorporated. However, the state-dependent model reproduces this very well. Um, and the model predicts that both the sensory gain and stimulus unrelated firing are sort of strongest in around the trough of the LFP. So what we can conclude from this is indeed, it seems that the phase of the LFP rhythm reflects changes in the sensory gain, in the output gain of individual neurons. Now, this was essentially taking both gain and background as dependent on the same frequency band, but you can also do it independently on different bands. And what you find is that delta phase seems to reflect changes in stimulus unrelated firing and theta alpha phase from 6 to 10 hertz reflects more changes in the sensory gain. So actually distinct frequency bands seem to map on slightly distinct um, implications on the encoding by individual neurons. Um, you can do the same thing for the power of these frequency bands and it turns out that the power First of all, incorporating power doesn't give that much of a boost in predictive power. And second, it mostly affected the stimulus unrelated uh, aspect and not the sensory gain. So indeed, this sort of suggests that it is correct to say that phase of delta theta activity seems to reflect cortical excitability, at least in auditory cortex, primary auditory cortex. And there is a change in the sensory gain as a function of the phase of, of ongoing network activity. The Giro and purple diagram in a way also implies not only, at least implicitly implies, that there's not only a modulation of firing rate, but that this really helps to chunk or partition the information that is being encoded by these neurons. And what I showed you so far is only that the sensory gain and hence the number of spikes produced by a neuron changes as a function of the network rhythm, but it's not really clear if this has any implications for information encoding or the representation of the acoustic environment. However, it does. So what you can do is you can, we can take these neurons and we can ask how well can we decode the identity of a sound from the spike train in, let's say, a 250 millisecond window. Um, and what you can do is you can then actually ask, what is the contribution of individual spikes, for example, spikes at different phase angles of the LFP, to the information encoding? And you can test this by using a single trial decoding algorithm and selectively removing spikes at each phase of the LFP. And you normalize all this also for, for overall differences in firing rates between the different phase bins. And what we find is in the real data, the spikes in the, around the trough carry about twice as much information as spikes at the other phase angles and maybe, I don't know, six or eight times as much as spikes at the peak of the LFP rhythm. So indeed, um, and yeah, and the model reproduces this, well, the state-dependent model, not as perfectly as, as you see it in the real data, but it, it, it shows that this sort of phase-dependent gain is an important aspect of this. And so what this shows is that indeed, these variations in sensory gain or the input-output transformation of auditory cortical neurons with the state of the network rhythms um, indeed has implications and seems to help to concentrate the sensory information that these neurons convey to particular epochs of the ongoing network rhythm, which provides support for this hypothesis of a chunking of information along the phase of these rhythms. So, yes, this prediction seems to be true. Um, another prediction we derived, and, and many others here in the room actually derived, and we've sort of borrowed this idea from, uh, from people in the visual system like Ruffin, is that there should be a perceptual correlate of also pre-stimulus phase and power on perception. And um, now this is work done in human subjects doing, doing EEG. And many years ago, we asked, essentially, does our ability to detect a faint sound depend on the phase or power of uh, presumably auditory cortical activity derived from the appropriate electrodes on the EEG? And we found, indeed, this is the case, that um, 
well, performance varies as a function of the phase uh, of the ongoing uh, EEG signal. Um, and then many other studies sort of confirmed this finding, and two years ago we looked at, again at the literature and we realized, wow, it's actually kind of a zoo of effects. Some studies use detection tasks, others use discrimination tasks. Some imply delta, theta, alpha, whatever you want, phase, power, or both. And it's kind of hard to come up with a unique, coherent picture about all these pre-stimulus effects. And so when, when trying to understand this, uh, we realized, well, maybe, okay, one important aspect is that different studies use different tasks, but then en engage different networks. But also, especially if we do EEG, we, we, we measure some rhythmic brain signal. We don't really know where it comes from. And in the end, the sensory or perceptual decision-making involves a number of transformations from the incoming sound to the encoding of task-relevant evidence in, for example, primary auditory cortex, where we know rhythmic activity reflects uh, changes in gain, but also many other brain regions in the frontal lobe before we actually make a perceptual choice or the subject presses a button. And so we try to disentangle these different steps uh, somewhat better, rather than just picking, for example, a certain uh, EEG sensor that sits over uh, the center of the head, which supposedly picks up auditory cortical activity. And so um, we, we use two different tasks in the same subject. It's, these are target and noise uh, tasks and subjects either compare the pitch of two brief tones or their intensity, and the tones come at an unpredictable time. But importantly, they're in the background noise because, as, as we know from uh, Zerfeld's work, if you don't drive the auditory system, you don't find any of these pre-stimulus effects. Um, and so, um, because auditory cortex or the brain is not really entrained by any rhythmic stimulus prior to the target sounds, there's no sort of position dependency on perceptual performance. However, you can still ask whether the ongoing brain activity prior to the target has a systematic influence on perception. And so because we wanted to look at possibly different aspects of brain activity, maybe auditory cortical activity, maybe more frontal activity, what we did is we used the EEG data and tried to split this into different components. And, and the way we did this is we used the li linear discriminant analysis to extract different EEG components that carry task-relevant sensory evidence. So we used single-trial decoding to discriminate the two auditory conditions that the subjects are discriminating their perceptual task. And this gives you, for each moment in time, uh, a certain split of the EEG components. And if you cluster these in time, we found for both tasks um, that there is um, sort of a typical more auditory, early auditory component and then, and then a later frontal parietal component. And what you can then do is you can project the single trial activity into these EEG components and look at these components which are defined after the stimulus has been presented, what happens in these actually prior to the stimulus. And then what you, what, what you can do is you can then ask what is the statistical relation between, for example, phase or power and different frequency bands, the sensory evidence that is reflected by these EEG components, and perceptual choice by essentially looking at these different uh, linear models using regression. And um, as Jonas sort of nicely said yesterday, if you don't know what you look for, you use the cluster stats shotgun to kill the problem. And that's what we did. Um, so this looks complicated. Um, what we have is two different tasks, the frequency discrimination task, intensity task. We have an early EEG component and we have a late EEG component. And we have uh, models linking choice to power, uh, choice to phase, and the sensory information to power and to phase. And um, this is messy, but surprisingly, the picture is relatively consistent across the two tasks. And that's something that encouraged us to, to actually believe in this. Um, so what we find is that in the early, probably more like auditory or temporal lobe component, um, pre-stimulus power in some frequency bands that differ between the two tasks seems to scale or drive or modulate the amount of sensory evidence reflected by the EEG signal. And in the later component, um, phase seems to have an influence on choice. We have actually since then replicated this in a number of independent uh, subjects. So I think one can believe in this sort of specific relation of power and phase 
uh, in different components uh, to, to sensory information and choice. Um, what is really important here is to essentially keep in mind that perceptual decision making is a cascade of many distinct processes and if we say the phase or power of an oscillatory activity has an influence on perception, it is quite difficult to say this because there's so many cascades involved and we have to be more specific about saying, well, maybe the phase in auditory cortex or the phase in prefrontal cortex or wherever you want is really implied in this process. And I think this is only a first step in sort of disentangling contributions of oscillatory activity, rhythmic activity, onto sensory encoding on the one hand and maybe decision-making processes on the other. Um, there seems to be, in this data, a nice dissociation between power and phase. Um, if that really generalizes, I don't know. It should be reproduced by other people. Um, so that's the second prediction. How much time do I have? Okay. Um, I want to talk about the third one. Uh, auditory cortical entrainment should be embedded in network context. Or in a way, I do. Um, because one prediction is that this entrainment that we know exists in auditory cortex and which is maybe influenced by visual stimuli and thereby makes auditory cortex more informative and perception better maybe, this all we sh should be sort of fed forward then from early auditory cortices onto other brain regions and that then in the end implement the perceptual benefit. And that's uh, where language or speech comes back in as a stimulus. So we went back to the idea of looking at audiovisual integration, um, and this is work done in human subjects using MEG, and we tried to look at the network organization of the visual enhancement of speech to brain entrainment. And the questions we're interested in is, well, first of all, do we see speech entrainment, so entrainment to the speech envelope, also outside auditory cortex, um, or is it more or less restricted to the temporal lobe? If so, where do we see a visual enhancement? We know it's, it's there in, in early auditory cortex, but do we see it in other parts of the brain as well? And if so, where does it actually predict the perceptual benefit of having better speech intelligibility in a noisy environment? And so what we did is we had subjects listen to uh, eight, six minute long texts that were um, presented either, well, there was a, a speaker visible on the screen and, and the subjects heard the sound, and we manipulated the acoustic signal to noise ratio and in one minute blocks in four different levels, and half of the time the face was informative, so congruent with the acoustic speech, and half of the time the face was actually just babbling and not congruent with the ongoing acoustic signal. And subjects were doing a uh, word recognition task at the end of each six minute blocks, and what you see as we know very well that intermediate acoustic SNRs, there is a perceptual benefit in the informative visual condition compared to the non-informative condition. And so the question is, can we explain this perceptual boost here by looking at the encoding of speech using MEG in, in, in some parts of the brain? And so what we did is we extracted the spe acoustic speech envelope also the lip contour of the speaker, and then we looked in different frequency bands of the source-localized MEG signal to look at the entrainment of, of brain activity to the acoustic envelope or the lip movement or both. Um, and to do this properly, we, we actually first asked what is the appropriate time lag which we have to use between the speech and the MEG signal, because if you think in neural terms, latencies in auditory cortex are much shorter than response latencies in prefrontal cortex, so we used uh, sort of a group level approach to find the optimal time lag both for the speech envelope and the lip contour in each specific frequency band to then characterize the entrainment. Um, we found significant entrainment in different frequency bands. That's not really that interesting. What is more interesting now is where is this entrainment actually affected by manipulations of the acoustic SNR or the visual context? And this we can do only for the encoding of the speech envelope because, well, the lip movements, um, actually we found that the encoding of the lip movements didn't really change as a function of the acoustic SNR, which is maybe not that surprising. So we use general linear modeling um, to look at where we see effects of SNR, visual context, or interaction of both in various frequency bands, all corrected for multiple comparisons uh, across everything in a way. And what we found is, well, 
that SNR or the, well, and I should say the, the entrainment, speech to brain entrainment was quantified using mutual information between the signal, the MEG signal in a certain frequency band and the speech envelope in the same frequency band. And so we see changes in sort of the speech representation with SNR in, in the number of brain regions in the temporal lobe, but also in the frontal lobe. That encoding is better at higher acoustic SNRs. This is not surprising because if the speech is more clear, well, you should get a better representation of it. Um, interestingly, we also found effects of visual informativeness and in that the encoding of the speech envelope is better in the visual informative condition around Heschel gyrus, so in, in auditory cortex, when the face was actually producing the speech rather than when the face was babbling. And sort of this, this reflects the sort of known effects that auditory cortex is enhanced in the visual, um, by visual context. And we found sort of negative or um, sort of uh, increasing enhancement of speech encoding with decreasing SNR in visual cortex and premotor cortex here in the one to four hertz frequency band. Um, which is very interesting, which suggests that re representations of the acoustic speech are enhanced, for example, in premotor cortex, particularly when we see the face and when the perceptual conditions are really adverse. So when, this, when the SNR is low, it's hard to understand the speech. That's when you sort of seem, should rely more on, on the actual face of the speaker. And you see an enhanced representation of the acoustic speech envelope in premotor cortex. And there's a number of interesting interactions in the frontal lobe, and um, this is shown more nicely here, positive interactions in the uh, dorsal frontal lobe and negative interactions in the more ventral frontal lobe. Um, in the IFG, we see very strong encoding of the speech envelope at high SNRs when there is a multisensory context or a congruent multisensory context, and the opposite pattern or sort of difficult to interpret pattern in the, the SFG. Now, this shows not only that there is speech-to-brain entrainment outside auditory cortex, but there seem to be functionally specific processes that are reflected by the speech-to-brain entrainment in the temporal lobe, in premotor cortex, and in the frontal lobe. Because we see different influences of SNR and visual context on the speech entrainment in these brain regions. Now, you can ask, does this, because we quantify, in a way, the fidelity by which the MEG signal reflects the acoustic speech envelope, but we know that the acoustic speech envelope and the visual lip movements, they're strongly correlated because otherwise, um, well, lip movements wouldn't really help us to understand speech. But you can, you can ask, are these sort of um, overlapping distinct representations of the acoustic and the visual signal, or is it a genuine visual enhancement of the acoustic representation? And one way you can address this is using conditional mutual information. And to summarize this, in large, what we find is that this, this entrainment to the acoustic speech envelope seems to be a genuine reflection of um, the encoding of the acoustic speech, in particular in, in Heschel gyrus and the STG, because if you compute the redundancy between the lip movements and the acoustic speech envelope, this is really small in, in early sensory areas, but it becomes larger in premotor cortex and, and the frontal lobe, which is what you would expect if you have overlapping representations of auditory and visual information. But more interestingly, you can then ask, so we have the speech-to-brain entrainment, mostly in delta and theta bands, in many distinct regions. We know perceptually subjects become better at a particular SNR, so where does entrainment reflect behavioral performance across all conditions? Um, if you incorporate SNR as well, we see that entrainment in the STG and the IFG are predictive of perceptual performance because these regions scale well with SNR. But if you actually ask specifically where does speech-to-brain entrainment reflect the visual benefit, so the difference between the informative and the uninformative visual condition, it turns out no brain region was predictive of this. Now, it could be that you know, we are looking at the entrainment to the acoustic envelope, which is maybe a very poor marker, of course, of speech encoding, so maybe that's the wrong measure to look at. Um, it could also be, well, that will be at least reasoned, that maybe in local encoding is only one aspect of brain function, but maybe communication is another very um, important contributing aspect. So what we tried, or what we did, is we quantified directed causal interactions between 
these different regions of interest, which we got from our effects of SNR and visual informativeness, and we used uh, information theoretic measure based on transfer entropy to look at directed functional connectivity. In fact, we used a measure that makes this a bit more specific to the sensory stimulus by you know, um, computing the directed connectivity across all conditions and subtracting out the connectivity at fixed stimulus, which in a, in a way leaves a measure that is more specific to communication that is specific to information about the sensory stimulus. This was developed by Robin Inch, um, published here in this paper. And so we, we computed this between our regions of interest and then asked again, well, where do we see significant directed interactions and where are these affected by acoustic SNR and visual context? And it turns out, um, and I've highlighted here the, the more interesting effects, there is changes in connectivity between the STG or the temporal lobe, the STG and Heschel gyrus and the IFG, which is enhanced to some degree by the visual context, by, the, by seeing the speaker's face and, by, well, when the SNR is higher, and also feedback interactions from the IFG back to the temporal lobes. So, sort of the connectivity between the temporal and the frontal lobes is enhanced when the acoustic SNR is higher and to some degree when there is actually relevant visual information. There's also directed connectivity from Heschel gyrus onto the premotor cortex, which reflects the sort of uh, enhanced entrainment in premotor cortex uh, at low SNRs, and also to, to the visual system. And then you can ask, do any of these changes in connectivity correlate with the perceptual multisensory benefit? And it turns out they did, at least for our data here, and both connectivity from auditory to IFG and back from IFG to the temporal lobe did correlate significantly with the subject-specific visual enhancement of performance. Sort of indicating that maybe, yeah, maybe it, is, it is good to ask where is encoding enhanced by visual context, but we shouldn't forget that maybe changes in connectivity are another important picture that we have to keep in mind. So, um, well, there's many conclusions one can take from this MEG study. We see widespread uh, patterns of speech envelope entrainment. They are differently affected by SNR and visual context in, in the temporal, frontal, and, and the premotor cortex. Um, and seeing the speaker enhances connectivity along the, the auditory uh, frontal axis. Um, and, um, well, to conclude, I spent two minutes on, on another project that Anne Keitel, who is here, showed on her poster yesterday. One drawback of this study is that we, we, we quantify behavioral performance only on, on a block-by-block -block basis. But in the end, what we really would like to understand is how visual benefits on a single trial level are mediated by, um, well, by the brain. And so uh, what we use is a concept of intersection information here, which was promoted by Stefano Panzeri recently in a, in a neuron paper. And the idea is you, you, you measure brain activity, you use for example, a single trial decoding algorithm to extract sensory representations from the brain. And you measure behavior at the same time, and then you ask essentially, where do these two overlap? So when can I correctly predict the stimulus from the brain activity, and when does this correlate with the correct choice of the subject? Now, to do this here, this is another MEG study, where we have all the different conditions. And what we use is a single trial decoding algorithm, not to look at speech-to-brain entrainment, but just to ask where can we read out individual words. Well, I should say this, is, this was a task based on uh, where subjects have here a, a single sentence, and then they have to do a task on a, on a specific word, which could be an adjective or a number. And then you can ask where can we read out the word identity, for example, the adjective from the MEG activity, and where is this predictive of perceptual performance? And we have some preliminary results. Uh, well, they highlight distinct areas in the auditory and the visual conditions. This is all ongoing work. <laughs> and so with this, I would like to thank all my collaborators, uh, Anne Keitel for this project, Bruno Giordano, who did the other MEG study that I talked about, and, and our funders and you for your attention. Really nice. Uh, I have a question about the, the first part. Um, so I really like this idea of uh, modeling the neural selectivities in, in A1 with the, uh, I think it was in A1, um, with the uh, non linear, nonlinear model, and then seeing which part mm -hmm. depends on, on the phase. 
And, uh, and my question is, what about the first part? What if you try to make the, the linear filter uh, phase dependent? Do you gain anything from this? No, we, we haven't really tried this because that's, that will be a huge parameter space to explore. Um, so we, basically, this is the standardized uh, approach that studies have used so far, where you have a linear filter that is rectified and then somewhat modified multiplicatively. Um, you could, you, yeah, you could f come up with other different models. Maybe they would perform much better. What we have to keep in mind is that even these state-dependent models, they give an R square of 0.3, so we, you know, we miss a lot of the response variance. Um, but, yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't have a good idea on how to modify this filter. I'm happy to hear suggestions. I mean, I don't know. You split the data in four phases, and you do your, your modeling independently for the four phases, and just look at what comes out, right? Yes, I think we, there was a reason why this didn't really work out very well. Well, one, well, I have to think about it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so, so I think it's somewhat a related question mm -hmm. because, I mean, you talk about the faces doing chunking, but in some of your previous work, you were also um, addressing the issue to what extent different information is encoded at different phases of these lower oscillations. And I think this approach is very elegant because it sort of increases the computational uh, uh, the power of what these oscillations might be doing. Um, so I'm just wondering. Mm -hmm. To what extent you are also pursuing this whole notion of, of, of phase coding, if you will? Well, so I mean, there's different views on the phase coding, right? What one thing we we showed previously is that sort of if you include the phase as another feature of the code, you can extract more information, mm -hmm. and actually the neural code becomes more insensitive to misalignments between the stimulus and the readout of the spike train, um, which may well what the brain is using, that in a way assumes that the downstream decoder has access to, to the face, um, which some people in the neural coding field criticized very heavily. Um, and so what we decided to show here is essentially that even if you look at single spikes, the, the amount of information that they hold about the stimulus uh, is dependent on the face. And so to, to in a way, this would not assume that the downstream decoder really knows the phase. It just shows that spikes at a certain time have more impact if you really decode each spike by each spike than others. But w w why can the downstream region know about the phase? Because then it fits into a framework in which you have, say, two oscillators coupled at these lower rhythms and then can exchange a, a, a phase code. Well, I'm not saying that they don't do. It's probably more okay. a matter of belief. Um, you know, if you have a neuron in A1 that projects to uh, somewhere in prefrontal cortex, you can ask, so how would the neuron in, in, in prefrontal cortex know about the phase in, in, in the auditory cortex? And some people believe that they would, and other people believe that they wouldn't. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I'm <laughs> um, I, I think it could be used, but... Who knows? We have to test this mm -hmm. causally. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it is interesting that my, my question is also about this work, which I like very much. So first, a simple question, which is um, when you model the background component, is that equivalent to what I call the additive component when we do the uh, gamma phase dependent uh, gain analysis, where we basically ask whether the response that we get is simply the addition of a stereotypical response on an ongoing um, phase-dependent firing rate. So it's simply the addition term. Yes, it's, it's, it's a pure additive term. That in a way explains the response when there is no sensory stimulus. Because, I don't know if you said this, so this is actually, these models were optimized on equal amounts of, background, of spontaneous activity and sensory-driven activity. Um, we actually did the whole, the whole study first on data from monkey auditory cortex, where we didn't include the spontaneous activity, and the reviewers said, this is all very nice, but you should optimize your model on spontaneous activity as well. 
which we couldn't. So we had to record new data and we used the rat as a model. Um, so I think this is really important because it, it um, constrains the model because in the end you want to fit or explain both changes in activity when the si system is driven but also when it is not driven because even in, in, sp in the spontaneous activity in the actual data there's a strong dependency between the spike and the phase which a static model cannot explain at all. Um, and to explain this you need this uh, change in, in, in background activity, so this additive offset that is phase dependent. Okay. I have one more question then. So you basically show that the quality of information representation depends on the phase. So it's probably related to the gain component that is phase dependent. It might be a bit hypercritical, but I mean, wouldn't you have to imprint? I mean, so this phase is entrained by the stimulus. Right, so wouldn't you then also have to show that the information content in the stimulus is not also modulated by the phase of the stimulus? It's not completely inconceivable, right? That in the stimulus, uh, I mean, as, as there is some delta rhythmicity in the stimulus, basically information content would be, I'm not saying that this is the case, I'm just mm -hmm. kind of trying to push it one. Well, actually this, I mean, we know that often, you know, at least in A1, the, the network is entrained by the stimulus, but this model here doesn't really assume that. That's not really built into the model, right? All that you want to do is you want to predict the... The model is optimized to predict the spike train as a function of time. And that by itself doesn't assume that anything is, is um, entrained, neither the response nor the network state. The network state is just an added parameter. If it happens to be entrained, fine, but it, the model doesn't rely on that assumption. So in a way, I mean, the model, um, if you look at this, well, oh, sorry, it's the wrong direction. If we take this neuron here in, in auditory cortex, well, Let's take this one, this is nicer. Um, <laughs> so in this part of the sound here, the, the network isn't really driven, the, the neuron is still sort of spiking, maybe it's spiking spontaneously, um, but uh, in a way the model is equally optimized on all these, these aspects of the response. Um, of course you could, you could actually ask which chunks of the response does it really fit well, which it does not fit well, does it only fit when the network is entrained or not, that's an interesting question. But it, it doesn't rely on that assumption at least. Okay, we have four more questions. They better be short, as do the answers. Okay, um, it will be a very long one. So thank you for the wonderful talk. I also have a question related to your uh, GLM model and the 2015 paper. So may we go back to the slide where you compare the four models? Here? Uh, no, where, where you, s yeah, this one. So it seems that you, want, you say, you conclude that the ones, that's what is more important is the gain, but what I see from here is what is more important is, uh, is uh, bias, the background, background uh, activity. Yes, that's actually, that's actually true. You, you need to, uh, well, that comes in part because the data as shown here is optimized to equal parts on spontaneous activity and stimulus-driven activity. Um, if you take only the spontaneous activity, of course, the bias is the only thing that actually matters. Mm -hmm. um, if you take only the stimulus part, the, this actually changes um, a little bit, and, and, and so the relative importance of the bias is reduced somewhat, but uh, they're roughly equally important, I would say. So uh, I would like to, to comment on this, because it reminds me of a paper in the visual domain by uh, Viar and Summerfield, like a modeling and behavior paper, where they, they try to see um, they influence prediction and attention, and they try to see how it modulates the encoding uh, of the information, like evidence accumulation. And their conclusion was that predictions was biasing, mm -hmm. was increasing the evidence, so it bias false on true positive, and which is a good thing, because when you predict something, you could say, okay, I need less evidence to conclude that this is what I saw. And while attention is like uh, modulating the gain, because you, you, you give more power, so you, you, you give more energy to accumulate evidence and increase your SNR. And I think it quite of fit with your conclusion about the phase on power stuff that you show the, this direct and mm -hmm. indirect influences on perceptual decision making, saying that the phase might be encoding, in the, might correspond to predictions, and so 
uh, modulate the bias, while the power might modulate the gain and correspond to an attentional component. So what do you think about this? I, I think that makes a lot of sense, yes. That's, that's basically our interpretation. OK. Yeah. yeah. Now, I mean, it's, well, of course, we have to keep in mind if you compare the two studies, one is, is a rodent auditory cortex, and the other is EEG, so you don't really you know, know what you measure. And that could, in a way, influence um, the results. But, but in a way, that would be the interpretation that, that maybe ongoing changes in ongoing activity in auditory cortex are sort of um, affecting the quality of the encoding, and the phase is more important for the decision process. What did? I have uh, two, two uh, points to make. One relates to uh, Ule's and Pascal's questions. I think that what explains it all, in my opinion, is the axiom that segmentation precedes everything. And what you are dealing with is segmentation. So when you are telling us about phase, it's phase with respect to what? And the what is the beginning of the theta cycle that is locked to the input. So it's a beautifully, in my opinion, <coughs> you know, uh, uh, you know um, demonstration of the axiomatic importance of segmentation in the syllable level. That's, that is my, my one, one point. Now, this is going further into your audiovisual study. You know, in clean, you have the, the reflection of the segmentation, the lips, for example, are, are giving you segmentation cues uh, that are overridden by the auditory because the auditory is much stronger, the auditory cues for segmentation. Noise comes and suddenly lips helps you to put together the window for doing the decoding. So you are not at all, in my opinion, addressing coding issues but rather a role of segmentation that helps coding. And I think it would be very interesting to see with respect to what you did with delays and all that, that, that psychophysics shows that if you listen to, to, you know, to speech that is shifted with respect to the lip movement, about 150 milliseconds you don't care, beyond that there is a confusion and, and performance drops. And the last comment that I want to make is with respect to Van Rupens, you know, uh, Rupens. Uh, so you ask for an alternative to a single neuron approximation, which I don't like. For example, Nancy's ping. You know, you talk about assembly. You, you talk about a network, and you talk about the behavior of a network inside the theta that you already segmented, the encoding of it. So now you are dealing with computers. It's not analytical study. So why not to take a, a complex network like this and play with its parameters to try to predict you know, the, the, you know, the role of, of the phase and all that. And lastly, there is a study that, lastly. Is, that is going on. You, uh, you know, UA soon is looking at the exact same stuff that you showed, but in, in the context of recognition. He takes speech, breaks it in a packet of speech, breaks it into two, and moves one sub packet with respect to the other, and indeed shows what you show that the second quadrant, the first and second quadrant, are the most important in terms of recognition. Great. <laughs> I think one can only agree with that. Huh? Okay, Simon and then Virginie. You're good? Okay, Simon and then. Um, is there an issue of model complexity? Uh, you're showing that you decoding better when you take into account both phase and, 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 and the gain. Uh, so I'm wondering, it wouldn't be that surprising that a more complex model does better. Yes, that, that is true. Um, I mean, so if you take, for example, the model where only one parameter is dependent on uh, the state, you see that, as we just noted, there is a difference between background and, and gain. And so that is within the same class of models. But what, what I think is more important is, is to actually see which frequencies are involved in a comparison between phase and power, which shows uh, radical differences. 
Um, so if we take the best model, maybe not surprisingly, it fits best. But um, well, especially if we make the two parameters dependent on distinct frequency bands, what is more important to note for me is to see which frequencies are involved with which parameter and how this differed between phase and power. Virginie, you want to yield your time to the coffee break? or you? Okay. In that case, thank you very much. Thank you.